Today's episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by Growing for Market Magazine. Which crops will pay back your investment in a hoop house or greenhouse? How does managing a greenhouse through the winter differ from summer growing? And which crops can just be overwintered in the field? Learn all that and more by subscribing to Growing for Market Magazine. The writers are farmers, not journalists. They won't tell you how to grow, they'll tell you how they grow, so you can decide what works for your farm. Growing for Market is celebrating 30 years of helping local food and flower growers succeed with articles written by experienced farmers from around North America. Since 1992, Growing for Market is by farmers for farmers. Plus, subscriptions start at only $30 per year. Whether you do farmers markets, local wholesaling, a CSA, or dream of starting a farm, Check them out today at growingformarket.com. Request a free sample, print, or digital copy from their website, and podcast listeners can get a new subscriber discount of 25% off with the code WINTER when subscribing at growingformarket.com. I think Growing for Market magazine is an excellent and affordable resource for any grower. Today's show is also brought to you by Johnny's Selected Seeds. Johnny Selected Seeds is a proud sponsor of the Winter Growers Podcast. Since 1973, Johnny's has supported farmers and gardeners with superior seeds, innovative tools, and pertinent information to help feed their families and communities and ensure their growing success. Our 40 acre research farm is the heart of Johnny's, where we trial thousands of varieties and tools every year. Our research team is dedicated to finding solutions to the ever changing challenges growers face, including disease, environmental, or insect pressures and shifting market trends. We invite you to visit the Growers Library at johnnyseeds.com to find technical resources like the Winter Growing Guide, which has tips on planting and harvesting into the shortest days of the year. You can also find variety comparison charts, extensive Jang roller trial results, and more. The employee owners at Johnny's are working hard to make 2022 a great year, and we look forward to growing with you. Welcome to the Winter Growers Podcast. Today, my guests are Mima Davis and her business partner, Miranda Dushek of Urban Buds Farm, which is a city-grown urban flower farm located in the heart of St. Louis, Missouri. The two of them have transformed an overgrown lot and property that had been left fallow for years into a productive four-season flower farm. The property is about an acre in production size, and it comprises eight contiguous city lots. They grow more than 80 different flower varieties, including ranunculus, lysianthus, dahlias, and their slogan is locally grown, not flown. They use compost, cover cropping, tarping, broad forking, and other no-till techniques. They have two unheated high tunnels, two heated greenhouses, a collection of caterpillar tunnels, and field production for all of their flower production. Their main sales outlets are weddings, a farmer's market in the summer, wholesale to area florists, events, and online orders for bouquets and flowers, which was actually a pandemic pivot. We dig into all of the challenges and techniques of growing year-round, and it's a conversation that I'm really interested in coming from a background of four-season vegetable production to really get to peek into what it takes to grow flowers year-round. So let's dig in. Okay, so welcome to the show, Mimo. It's so great to have you today. Really great to be here, Claire. I'm so excited. Well, good. Well, um, I was just remembering that we first met in 2016 at the Missouri Organic Association uh, Farmer Conference, and I, it was so great to meet you because for someone who's been you know, involved in four-season farming my whole life, I really was not aware of four season flowers. <laughs> and, oh yeah, right. Exactly. And it was so cool to be able to, you know, talk to you and to listen to your presentation about what you do because I guess, you know, for someone I just never really conceptualized what that would be like, how you know, how you would do that, what varieties you'd be growing. So I'm really excited to to dig into some of those details today and and share that with our listeners. Um Let's do it. Good. Sure. Well, well, good. And first, but first, I always want to like hear, you know, 
your story, your background, how you got into farming, you know, have you always wanted to farm or did it come to you later in life? You know, tell me your story. Well, uh, my story, uh, it definitely came later in life. Um, my, I, I, my mom and I lived in New York City. We had never, Midtown Manhattan, never grew a plant. I didn't have any plants. Um, and my mom started to date a man in Missouri. And <laughs> he mentioned, he was a great lister. And she mentioned that she really liked houseplants. And um, as a wedding present, he bought her a house that um, from Master Gardeners that had 132 rose bushes in the backyard and a, kind of like one of these lean-to greenhouses, sunrooms, last sunrooms attached to the house as a wedding present. Wow. <laughs> and, and it was packed with stuff. And so when I flew in for the wedding from New York in 1989, she walked me into the, and I was going to stay there while they went on their honeymoon for a week. And uh, she walked me into that greenhouse and she said, look, I don't know what any of this stuff is, but don't let anything die. <laughs> and that, Tall and order. That kind of, it, right. And that kind of birthed my, um, and in that week, I was in social work. And uh, in that week, um, I had decided to try and make my mom a little scrapbook as a wedding present. And I drove around to all the, nurseries in Jefferson City, Missouri, and with little pieces of leaves, <laughs> um, trying to identify them, and I was going to make her a little scrapbook, and in that week, I totally fell in love with agriculture, or, or whatever this was, you know, and I really wanted to know more, and I also got a newspaper, and at that time in Midtown Manhattan, I was in a studio apartment, and what I was paying for a studio apartment, I get own a, 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 a in rent I, I could own a 20 acre farm in Missouri okay mm. um so and that was in 1989 and I was like what am I doing and I just decided to retool myself and um I'm I packed up and moved I wanted something more and I moved to really funny because uh you know, I'm an African-American woman and I moved to this really rural community. I bought a farm and where in, in, in town they had um, a four-way stop sign. I mean, you know, I and, and people really thought I was having some type of a midlife crisis. It was a midlife crisis, actually, but it, it was one that I was, you know, moving toward. And um, and I retooled myself and. Uh, I did not know I could go work on a farm and, and do an internship or any of that. So I went back to school. I bought a farm, went back to school and um, got a job at um, a wild, Missouri wildflower nursery to really learn how to grow plants. And every day he would um, give me a flat of something and he would say, go plant this on your farm. And I did that for like um, all through school. I worked for him and and I started at the end, I was making bouquets for friends and for birthdays. And and I'll never forget Mervyn. He took me, uh, Mervyn Wallace uh, of Missouri Wildflowers, took me up on this bluff. And as far as you could see was the actress. It's a purple flower. And he's like, yeah, when I first started my business, I used to sell these to florists for a dollar a stem. And I started counting one dollar, two dollars, three dollars. I mean, there's thousands of them out there. I was like, oh my God. And I was making bouquets for friends for birthdays. And people were like, your flowers are so beautiful. You need to take these to farmer's market. And Merv um, said, you know, I was in my fifth or sixth year. He said, you know, I drove down his driveway to start the season. He was like, you're, you know, I've taught you everything you need to know. You need to go do something with that farm. And uh, so I started doing the Columbia Farmer's Market in Columbia, Missouri. And the farmers around me, you know, I had some really great farmers, Terry Durham, um, and and they would all say, hey, your flowers are so beautiful. You know, you're never going to make a living at far doing just farmer's market. You need to walk these into a florist. And I was like, oh, no, I could never do that. Have them criticize my babies. And But it rained three, one day it rained three, three weeks in a row. I mean, it was like a river runs through it and there's nothing like a like a, a wet flower. Um, 
And I had already identified the best florist in town. You know, I was like, if my flowers are going to get shot down, they're going to get shot down by the very best. And I, at the end of market, my mortgage was due. And, 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 you know, I was really starting to struggle a little bit. And I took the best bucket of what I had into a florist. And I was like, I don't know anything about this, but I'm trying to sell these flowers. And she looked down and she was like, oh my God, these are perfect. I have a funeral this afternoon. And, and, in that moment, I knew my flowers were at least good for dead people, you know, I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that kind of launched me, you know, in the early 90s, uh, doing a bucket truck, um, driving fl- flowers around the florist and doing farmer's market. So I, that, I've had two farms. That was at, uh, my first farm was Wild Thang Flower Farm, and um and and that was my first farm, and and now here we are in in St. Louis um, with my business partner Miranda Dushak. We have Urban Buds, which is comprised about an acre. It, 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 hey, listen, if I'm moving too fast, you just cut me off and ask me questions. No, no, this is good. You're 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 uh, you're you're jumping right into what I would have asked next. So go for it. <laughs> so um, so I left farming for a little while, and uh, I was farming. It was uh, in Ashland, Missouri. It's about two hours out of St. Louis. I was doing four acres of flowers, um, running a crew um, and driving into the city twice a week. And it was really unsustainable in my life. You know, I was trying to do it alone and and manage people. And, um, and I was driving into St. Louis twice a week. And it was just really, really difficult. And um I mean, I, it, it is difficult, meaning like I, it, you know, come into farmer's market or going home from farmer's market. It was crazy what I was doing, really insane. I, uh, you know, ended up in a ditch twice, falling asleep at the, behind the wheel, you know, and, um, and um, you know, leaving the house, at, staying up all night, getting ready for market, then leaving the house at four o'clock in the morning and making the market on time. It was, it was just not sustainable for me and driving into St. Louis and, and uh, I, in the winter, I was at that point going around and, and doing little speaking engagements around the country. And I was in North Carolina and they were like, hey, we need more women of color in agriculture, you know, with some letters behind their name. And I was like, I was looking for something different to do. Maybe did not know I was looking for something different to do, but they offered me a full ride and I needed, you know, a break. And I went to... Uh, uh, North Carolina to get my master's. I was supposed to continue to get my PhD and I just missed farming too much. I was like, you know what? I'm a farmer. And what did you get your, your master's at? What was your master's in? Uh, um, horticulture. Great. Yeah. And, uh, at that point I, I, uh, to that around 2008, the economy was tanking and, um, and the Missouri department of agriculture and Lincoln university called me up and they said, Hey, are you coming back to the state? Because we need we need somebody in the urban core of St. Louis doing agri- urban agriculture. And I was like, well, <laughs> you know, I need a job. And uh, <laughs> so I went and worked for Extension, um, University Extension, Lincoln University Extension, where I met Mir- Miranda. And Miranda and I struck up a, friend, a friendship. I think it was just our bottom line love for the land and love for farming and love for what we wanted to do. And one day she looked at me and she said, Mima, you know, I don't know what you're doing here, but you're a farmer and you need to be on the farm. So we talked about farming together. And one day Miranda called me up and she says, hey, there's this, somebody called me about this um, abandoned greenhouse in Dutchtown, which is in St. Louis. Do you want to go have a look at it? And, And we came over and we broke into the place and it was abandoned. It had been condemned for like not in, abandoned and condemned for like nine years. And this is a glass greenhouse. And, you know, we walked in here and glass was literally crunching under our feet. I mean, that's, and neither one of us had rehab experience. Okay. And Miranda looked at me and she said, I don't know, Mima, you know, and there was a, a falling down, a house falling down on the property. And Miranda looked at me and said, I don't know, Mima, who's going to buy this? And I had, I saw the vision the second I walked in and I was like, we are, we're <laughs> going to buy this. And, um, you know, and that was like uh, eight years ago. And, um, you know, we've had two major rehabs um, since then. Um, 
And the farm itself, it sits on about an acre of land. Well, we farm actually that acre. And in the city, it com it's comprised of eight city lots, okay? The farm is um, contiguous lots. And we, we started off with four lots. And over time, we've been, a we've had been blessed to buy um, some more lots that have just, for one reason or another, a house burnt down and the city tore down that house and we were able to buy that lot. So our farm is eight, eight contiguous lots. What, Mima, what, what was the soil like when you found that property? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the farm, the main farm, the uh, original four had, had never had anything on it. You know, it was, well, the farm, okay, let me tell you about the farm. The farm itself was always a farm and dates back to the late 1800s and was always a flower farm. It was a florist called Hell's Floors, and they used to grow flowers and make arrangements and sell to people around St. Louis. And um, they used to have a bucket truck that said, go to Hell's Floors on the side of it. And, um, you know, <laughs> they, they, yeah. Sorry, good <laughs> sense of humor there. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, so it was always a florist shop and it was always a flower farm dating back to the 1800s. It was just a it's, blessing. It's faded. I mean, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah. So the the four lots, it's always been a farm. And then the other lots that we've added on, you know, we have not had um, re remediation problems, um, issues, thank God. So that's been pretty good. Um, we've actually bought in soil, which is extremely expensive. Um, so we're building up because in St. Louis, when... The, you know, a lot of the homes are brick, so when they dis, when they demolish homes, they tend to bury it. You know, they haul off what they can and then bury the debris. So we tend to we build up. We bring in soil, we make raised beds, and we build up, and that's how we kind of contend with that. So that that must take take quite an amount of you know money and oh. time and <laughs> yeah money time. <laughs> labor we just finished up another expansion project here and claire i think that's about it for me they just uh tore down a house across the street and you know i'm i'm just i'm i keep looking at that property and I'm like you know nah i'm not motivated to do another lot um but uh yeah i feel really great with where we're at and um time it's expense we've written several grants that have through the Missouri Department of Agriculture, which we are so grateful for. Um, they've really supported us with rehab of, of these uh, lots. So you're growing uh, over 80 different kinds of flowers on those properties, right? Correct. What are your, I'm curious what your primary, your favorites, your big sellers are? What are the ones, the standouts? Our main um, crops that we grow, really, our big crops are ranunculus, lisianthus, and dahlias. Yes, and dahlias. Um, yeah, those are our, our big crops um, where we grow. We start cutting on um, ranunculus in January, and here it is June, June, the beginning of June, and we just finished the dahlia season. Our, our last dahlias went to, I mean, our last ranunculus went to market this past weekend. Wow. And and you've so the those favorites or the standouts. How much of that has been informed by you know the the property, the land, the the season, the demand? I'm always curious how like you know you land on those those one. Those yeah, three. well, I'm I'm a I, I love love winter growing. You know, it's it's hot in Missouri. It is humid. It's buggy. You know, there's lots of competition. There's, you know, a lot of reasons why not to grow in the summer around here, okay? I love winter growing. So that's how we kind of landed on those. It's like, hey, you know, in the winter, it's quiet. It's a, it's a slower pace. It's less buggy. There's nothing like being in, in a greenhouse in February. You eat a greenhouse when it's February. There's nothing like it. And the flowers are amazing. You know, we grow delphinium in the winter. We grow um, ranunculus, freesia, stock, sweet peas. 
you know, it's spring, right? So it's all about life and living and being born again almost. And the flowers are amazing. I mean, in the summer, you know, who can't grow a zinnia? Come on, you know, you know, everybody's got zinnias, everybody's got sunflowers, everybody's got celosia, you know, but it's those more winter crops, the freesias, the you know, that that you just don't see on the marketplace that much. So the winter growing, it's my favorite time of year. Yeah, I mean, I, I know those feelings. I mean, even though I'm not doing any flowers, I mean, even just walking into the spinach, you know, high tunnel yeah. and putting your hands into the soil and smelling the earth and the green, you know, vibrant green color. I mean, it really does sort of feel like a renewal and eternal spring. So, right. And I, I used to, I used to get so depressed when winter would hit. It literally healed my seasonal depression. Um, yes. You know, it really, it really took care of that. So that's how I, you, the question was, how did I land on growing these crops? I landed on it because it was good for my soul. And, and, you know, it was, it was thinking outside the box. And also if you're in, I tell you what, I don't even understand, but how people do it. But if you think about all of the major holidays, right. Let, 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 let's kind of go flower holidays, you know, <laughs> You know, when are, it's crazy about when they are, right? Right. I mean, they they start with Valentine's Day. They're mostly then, in the winter. <laughs> yeah, they're mostly in the winter, early spring, where if you're just growing in the fields, you left half of the industry money on the table. And for us, in or, for me, in order to really be a full-time, have this be my full-time income, to really make this work, I feel like it's really imperative that I, and be in the marketplace. A long time ago, how this really started was through uh, Deborah Printing. She said, we were having this discussion around local flowers versus flown in flowers. And she was like, yeah, I mean, I get it, the local flowers, but what about winter? And she had a point and it was a challenge for me to figure out what we can do to fill that gap. And I know it's just me, I'm not gonna you know, change the in- industry, but if I could do my part, that was going to be important for me. So all those reasons is why, you know, I landed on winter growing. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, you know, sharing your story right now, I mean, hopefully that'll inspire more people. So it does have a ripple effect. But what I'm really now curious about, though, Mimo, is how do you do it? (laughs) I mean, can you describe maybe a little more of the details of yeah. Kind of what your cropping system looks like, um, what, you know, infrastructure you're using, uh, you know, how you're able to, do you trick the the plants at all? Like w- what techniques are you using to do this? Yeah. Okay. So for dahlias, for, we also grow dahlias over the winter. So you said tricks and um, we do, you know, our lighting, we do light the dahlias. That's the only crop we really light our dahlias for one hour in the middle of the night. They're on timers. And we trick them into thinking that they're getting two, you know, short days. We start our winter production really at the end of September. It's still really hot in Missouri, um, really until, you know, mid-October. But we really start gearing up. Um, We try and get our plugs in. We try, well, we try and get our bulbs in anywhere toward the end of September, beginning of October. You know, that's, that's always a struggle. Um, because our bulb suppliers, you know, our bulbs are coming from Holland and, and, and it's really difficult to to get them when we really need them, get them here on time. But as soon as they get in, we, we're starting with freesia. We're getting freesia and ranunculus in the heated greenhouses. We heat greenhouses to maximum heat is 55. We don't go above 55. And you've got two heated greenhouses yes, in the winter, is yes. that correct? And two unheated? Yes, two, yep. um, heated and two unheated. That's correct. And what, what would be in the heated versus the unheated in the winter? Well, uh, you know, we could overlap those crops. It could be the same crops. Um, ranunculus goes everywhere, okay? Ranunculus will go, We you know, we do like eight successions, maybe six successions of ranunculus, six to eight um, of ranunculus. So we'll plant our first, um, because it's still so hot, we will not put our first ranunculus in the glass house but it'll go in our heated poly house. And then the second succession will go into the glass house. And then the third succession will go in the tunnel. And the fourth succession will go into a caterpillar tunnel. Are you following what I'm saying? Yep, yep. I mean, similar to how we 
do successions of other uh, vegetable crops. So, yeah. Right. So, um, you know, they could overlap, you know, in the heated structure, in the glass, we really love delphinium. Um, freesia, uh, I really love the freesia in the glass. Um, we grow poppies for early production. We, you know, we've already ordered and we do, uh, we're our tulip forcing, we force tulips. Uh huh. So we really, we're trying to, you know, have our goal goals to really have flowers producing in January, right? So, or, or we definitely want to be in the marketplace by Valentine's Day. We want to be going strong in the marketplace for direct to floors. We don't do farmers market then only because they're not happening, but we definitely want to be with our floors, our, our wholesale customers by Valentine's Day. And so um, let's see here then. So your sales outlets, you do direct wholesale to florists. What else do you do? What, what sort of, how does the year break down with your sales? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do, um, we do a fabulous, we do wholesale to florists. Um, and that starts, you know, January. And then we have a, a fence, fabulous farmer's market, Tower Grove Farmer's Market in the middle of a beautiful park. And that starts April. Is that just once a week? Just a weekly market? Yeah, that's yep. once a weekly market. It, 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 does, it, has two, it, it happens twice a week. We only do the Saturday market. But, you know, our COVID pivot was to do a petals off our porch. Hmm, which, I like that. <laughs> which was a socially distant pick up the petals off the farm, you know, pick up bouquets on our porch. Hmm. And, and that was our COVID pivot. And, you know, it's a COVID pivot that's that's here forever. I mean, it's it really went well. You know, I mean, it was amazing. You know, of course, all the restaurants were closed. Movie theaters were closed. Travel wasn't happening. People were stuck at home. You know, they were feeling freaked out. So, of course, what did they want? They wanted flowers. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and um, and again, our season extension pulled through for, you know, our heated structures pulled through for that, right? I mean, if we were just field farming, we wouldn't have flowers then. So we were really able to service our community by, you know, being in production then and, that, and being able to make, to roll with it. I had heard that there was, you know, that that the city was going to shut down and I didn't know what was going on. And and I drove around the floors and they looked like deer in the headlights. The the community um, health officials were going to shut them down. And it was right in March when our greenhouses are just like bubbling, like bulging with, they were packed, ready to go, ready to rock and roll. And I used some words and I was like, Hey, I don't, what, what are we going to do? You know, <laughs> you, know um, you know, and then we got, you can't um, eat flowers. So. <laughs> yeah, you can't eat them. And, 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 um, and then I, I came home and I was like, okay, the farmer's market is starting, you know, soon. And I came home uh, after a delivery and Miranda was like, Hey, did you see the email from tower Grove? They're shutting down the farmer's market. And I was like, okay. So and, you know, I went into the crew that day and I was like, listen, you know, there's no secret bank account. There's no, you know, family fund. The only way for us to stay employed here is to sell these flowers. And my crew that, you know, I have a fantastic crew. Everybody opened up a computer. And by that day, end of that you know, business day, we had an online store and launched it. And our customers, you know, really supported us and really got us through the pandemic. So you had you had online ordering of, of bouquets that sort of had contact less pickup on your porch. Is that right. how it worked? Yeah. Right, right, right. And and people customized what they wanted or did you offer sort of a set, you know, style? No, actually, actually, I'm sorry. It wasn't bouquets. We uh, we would just put loose flowers. It, it was flowers in a bucket. Got it. <laughs> It was like flowers in a bucket, you know, and you could decide what you wanted to pay for, you know, and people ordered. And I mean, they really, really supported us. It was a mutual relationship. You know, they needed they needed some soothing. They needed comfort and we needed to move flowers. Yeah. Did you deliver too, or did you do like a delivery? We did. We did. 
we did do a delivery service. We did on Saturdays only. But yes, we did do a delivery also. That must have been, I can imagine, you know, very heartwarming in some ways to be able to, you know, go to people's homes, especially if they were stayed at home and scared and, you know, to bring them this bouquet or flowers. It must have been quite an experience to have that. I still to this day think of boy, I have a couple of customers who have been customers of mine for 20 years who they never left their house in a, in a year. And I showed up every Saturday or somebody from here showed up every Saturday. And I, when I did it, I would, you know, ring your doorbell and then I would take, you know, 20 steps back and I would be like, Hey, how you doing? You hanging in there? You know, it was just this, special connection you know they're older and it was really really important yeah no that's i love that hey podcast listeners we're going to pause for a moment to hear from one of our show sponsors today's show is also brought to you by tunnel vision hoops tunnel vision hoops designs and manufactures do-it-yourself high tunnels hoop houses and greenhouses with an extensive array of products to help large and small growers become more productive They have 11 different tunnel widths to fit any application and designs to stand up to weather conditions from coast to coast. Tunnel Vision is also a national distributor of parts and accessories needed to build, maintain, or upgrade an existing tunnel or hoop house. Check out their Tunnel Vision Hoops YouTube channel for instructional how-to videos to help build a great high tunnel or hoop house. Here at Four Season Farm, we have two movable high tunnels made by Tunnel Vision Hoops, and they are definitely my favorites. To learn more, visit their website at tunnelvisionhoops.com. Now, back to the show. And then weddings, right? You do a lot of weddings? Uh, well, no, we don't do a lot of we don't do a lot of weddings. We we're pretty particular. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, like we're not the, you know, we're not the people that you're gonna bring your swatch to. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> um, we get, we are very um we, we we actually choose the wedding. We're we're not you know we don't want the stress. We don't do. We're gonna send you to one of our floors that buy flowers. Or, you know, if you want something extra. What, um, I mean, describe like what, what would be your, your ideal wedding customer? Our deal. Oh, oh, yeah. Our <laughs> ideal wedding customer is, is usually familiar with what we do. Uh huh. They're, they're a farmer's market customer that says, we love your work. We trust you do what you do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's great to be able to have them put, their trust in you, especially on celebrating, you know, their big day. So I'm, I'm curious about sort of your, you know, your farming style, the techniques you're using to manage fertility and soil and um, what, what sort of techniques are you using? Yeah, we're using, you know, we used to till and we have now moved away from that and we we're using tarps and, um, Cover cropping and then tarping um, is really what we're about now. So t- talk to me about like the sequence that you would use for for an example plot. Like, you know, start with cover cropping to tarping to the transplants and the flowers. How would that look? Right. Okay. So what we do is first off, we would probably you'd be taking out a bit. Okay. And we would try, like right now, we'd be putting in buckwheat, um, letting that buckwheat come up, and then crimping that buckwheat and tarping it for like three weeks. And then pulling off that tarp, and we would either be laying landscape fabric or planting right into that soil. Um, we might add compost. We Usually we add compost in the fall, um, depending on what our uh, soil test is saying and our soil test this year said it's great. It's so weird not to add compost, you know, when the, when the soil test says, Hey, you're doing great. Don't add anything. That's like really like, it it like goes against, uh, you know, my gut to not not be throwing down compost. So, um, so yeah, Claire, uh, Miranda just walked in and I just want to, you know, basically include her in on this. Of course. Uh, Yeah. 
So, so that we would be putting in that crop and um, letting it grow on, right? And then cutting on that crop. Um, let's say with some flowers, we're going to cut them off at the base. We don't pull anything out. We try not to pull things out because those roots and stuff really help feed the microorganisms in the soil. Then we're going to go back through and cover crop that or just put a tarp back on for the next crop coming in. How do you deal with those like woodier stems though of, of you know, of flowers that might be harder to break down if you're not pulling them? Yeah, we we'll cut them off at ground level. Got it. Okay, and then you're just able to tarp and allow it to um, break down enough for the right. next crop. Some sometimes we won't even tarp. We'll actually just plant, you know, among those. Like our our recently in in our glass house, not recently, but a couple months ago, our anemones were going out, and we just planted our lisianthus crop interplanted it in there and let them die, let the anemones die down and the lisianthus come up in hopes that then the anemones will come up in the fall. So, yeah. So Miranda, do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about um, sort of, you know, maybe your story, your, your part on this, you know, this journey with, with Mima, like just give us a little bit more about your background. Uh, okay, great. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for including me today. Of course. Um, yes. So my name is Miranda Dushak, co-owner of Urban Bud City Grown Flowers. I got into sustainable agriculture about 20 years ago, and I started with um, food, poultry, orchards. I'm a fourth generation beekeeper. I've done restored Iowa tall grass I'm a graduate of the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. I did their sustainable agriculture program in the early 2000s. So my background was really coming at farming with a, a food justice orientation. And I spent uh, about 10 years in my 20s living in intentional communities uh, that had a farming component or I would be, say, living in a house of hospitality for formerly homeless women and children, and then working on a goat dairy for paid work. And I did that um, for about 10 years. My last gig was working at a, a convent of nuns growing food uh, with them, for them in Iowa. And it was around 2010. And um, you know how it is being a seasonal farm worker. You know, I, at that point, I was making about $9 an hour and I was pushing 30 years old. So I moved to St. Louis uh, with, uh, you know, friends brought me down. They said, come on down. We have an urban farm down here. We have a house of hospitality doing work with undocumented, mentally ill and drug addicted uh, immigrants and refugees. You want to come down? And I was like, absolutely. So um, <laughs> I came down and... Um, was working there, but you know, after farming for about 10 years in that manner, you know, small scale sustainable agriculture, I said, man, I, I'm just not making it. I had $5,000 years, $7,000 years. I said, it's either grad school or bus. But this job at uh, Lincoln University Cooperative Extension came open as regional small farm specialist, and I uh, applied for it. They, they hired me. Lincoln is Missouri's 1890 land grant institution, historically black college and university. And um, my job, which I still have, um, is to work with limited resource minority and socially disadvantaged farmers in the St. Louis area. So there I met Nima, who was working as a horticulture specialist. She had left Wild Thing Farms, got her master's and was working at Lincoln. So we were both there and we just hit it off. You know, I think I knew that you need a really committed farming partner to make this happen. And um, there was someone who had a track record of success, a hard worker, and we appreciated each other's talents. So I, I got the call about this uh, building in my capacity as a small farm specialist for Lincoln University and the owner of the, of the building of the farm, the remnants of our farm, right? called me up and said, hey, do you know anyone who'd want to want to buy this place? And so he brought me down and looked at it. You know, I don't know if she told you, but the farm is dates from 1870, what we have records on. 
it always was a farmer florist. There's these old glass Lord and Burnham uh, greenhouses on it. Mima's giving me the hurry up. Right yeah. <laughs> No, it's great. Great to hear your 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 side of the story too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, we said uh, it was really trashed out here. Um, you know, our neighborhood. The neighborhood grew up what was left of the farm, right? This this property was condemned and vandalized. The properties to the south were condemned and vandalized, and you know, we just said let's do it, and um, it has been. I, a tough road to hoe, a labor of love, a passion project. So Mima and I both stayed working full time. And in year four and a half, the farm was able to support itself, which was a big deal, right? We stopped putting in our paycheck. Uh, we were able to start hiring more people, have people um, help us not working. I mean, literally, we were working seven days a week at that time. So week four and a half, or I'm sorry, year four and a half, farm supported itself. Year five and a half, um, Mima was able to quit Lincoln University, come home and work full time on the farm. So the farm's able to support her and then uh, employees. Year nine, uh, Miranda got her first paycheck, which is awfully exciting. So <laughs> I'm getting paid now for my labor on the farm. I still uh, work my off-farm job, as we know from the National Agricultural Statistical Service, that usually uh, when farms hit around three hundred and twenty-five to three hundred and fifty thousand dollars gross, that's when both members of the farming couple can come home. Um, so we're not there yet. I mean, those are national averages. It can it can change. We're not there yet, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> You have you have a son uh, named August who's almost five too. Of course, you know bringing a child onto a farm can make it both more challenging and more wonderful. And I was just wondering about your experiences having August. Yeah, so August um, is the joy of both of our lives. I think we could agree on that. He was, um, you know, I I knew that I wanted to have a baby. And um, Mima was on board with that. So, you know, it happened. He's amazing. What changed with having August was the need for more money, right? In terms of schooling, right? People ask us like, oh, I thought you were going to homeschool. It's like, are you kidding me? With running, <laughs> like running a farm and working an off-farm job? Are you kidding me? So school, child care, where we are in St. Louis, um, the it's pretty much charter or private are, is the way you got to go um, for a lot of people. So, and then just the, just the time, I mean, Mima does her share, I will say that, but when push comes to shove, like, you know, I'm the prim primary August care. So when she was talking about winter production, I'm sure, and, and talking about the heat going out and doing the heat all night. No, we haven't done that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm always sort of like default August care. And um, that makes it harder for me to um, work the farm as, as much as I'd like. So I'm very proud that Mima was able to come home and farm full time in year five. I'm really proud that by year nine, I'm getting a paycheck. And, you know, who knows uh, what my timeline looks like. But um, I wouldn't trade August for having the farm. I could still have you know, $20,000 years, $25,000 years if I didn't have August, but um, that's not the way we're doing it. Yeah. So, so tell me about those heating challenges this winter, uh, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> As a four season farm, that's always expected. <laughs> you know, it's definitely not all roses, you know? No. Um, so um I'll tell you a couple of things. One is uh, last year, or two years ago now, we had a polar vortex come through. And at the same time, our heaters went out. We weren't really on top of our game in that we didn't have monitoring systems that wake us up. You know, that the phone goes off and the alarms go off. Um, and we learned our lesson. Eight days before Valentine's Day, we lost an entire crop of ranunculus. And that, that was tough, but we, you know, it's learning. It's a learning curve, you know, we learn. So this past year, the polar vortex came through and um, I was, we were actually, you know, we had post-traumatic stress, right? <laughs> we were like, okay, okay. We know what this can look like. We 
We bought in supplemental heaters in case we needed to use them. And we did need to use them. I mean, we, we had already had our monitoring system in place and we were able to pull through it. But there were nights that we were up all night because the alarms would go off and we're like, uh-oh. And because um, it got so cold and we did use the backup heaters that we had bought in. There were like three, four nights straight in a row that we were just literally up all night because I was about to lose those crops again. We just, we just weren't, that wasn't going to happen. The heating line was freezing on it, the um, side of the gas company. So we, we heat here with natural gas. So when we bought the property, the water line wasn't working. The gas line wasn't working. You know, there are lots of things going on, but we're right here in the city. If you came to our, our farm, you would be right in the city, you know? So we have, we have access to natural gas. The issue was in the neighborhood, the pressure on the nat natural gas was, was low because consumption was so high apparently. So it kept freezing outside of the building, which we really don't have control over until finally one of the myriad gas company employees taught Mima and Morgan how to drain the condensation out of the gas line on the gas company's side of the meter. But right. long story short, <laughs> long story yeah, short. It, it, it was the gas, it wasn't our fault. It was the gas company's fault. And this guy like literally showed me how to take a propane torch to a gas line. Yeah. And he was like, as he was leaving, he was like, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to, I want to hear about you all on the six o'clock news. Okay. <laughs> oh man. I mean, that's farming, right? Yes. I mean, <laughs> I'll say about our business, like Mima and I have learned lots of lessons being like two women running a business with this like big constant rehab project, it seems like. But, you know, over the years, we have been so blessed by the workers that come here, the city, the relationship with us. And, you know, we really try to make friends with the sewer people and the the sanitation folks and the gas company folks and the electric folks, because those are the ones that are coming out here, God knows when, helping us figure stuff out. Yeah, so. those are the people that are in the trenches with you. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's funny because I remember we had one winter, um, we had this horrible ice storm here in Maine. And the it it iced everything up so badly that the roads were just impossible to drive on. But we ended up the timing was such that the we ran out of propane in one of our tanks for, you know, heating one of the greenhouses and running the generator. And right. I remember my dad on the phone with the driver of one of the propane trucks, like trying to bribe him with a bottle of, you know, of Jim Bean to, to come <laughs> right. down and like, you know, come to, to fill our tank because we were desperate. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's. You know, my, my tip is, and, and I kind of handle a lot of the, like, the bills, the money, the, like, grant organization stuff, you know, I do a lot of the, like, paperwork and things like that, but one of my tips is always, you know, we're, we're Christmas celebrators, but, like, Christmas gifts to the street sweeper, Christmas gifts to the people who plow, you know, as, like, as many of those people you can kick to get. It's a community. It takes a community. <laughs> and certainly, certainly the postal carriers, because how many times have they made sure our, our seeds don't freeze or our bulbs are in the right place? My goodness. Yeah. Wow. Good. Well, we're, we're just getting low on time here, and I do have this lightning round of questions Okay, so first question is, uh, I mean, you could, some of them you could, you both could answer too. Uh, favorite crop to grow, cook, or eat? Oh, a ranunculus for me. <laughs> a flower crop? Oh my goodness. I mean. It could be uh, food too. Campania, and then, I mean, I love keeping bees. Okay, but so here's a question. Is there, is there a favorite um, flower to, that you can both grow, cook, and eat? <laughs> favorite flower that you. Stock. <laughs> Stock. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see. Next question. Uh, favorite music that you listen to while farming? Does it have to be music? I, I listen to podcasts. I, I love listening to podcasts. Oh, while Mima farm. loves Alabama State. <laughs> and I love Alabama State. <laughs> okay. What about you, Miranda? Oh, golly. I don't know. I love 60s soul. Great. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, favorite way to relax or self care activity? Swimming. 
I travel for me. Where do you like to travel to? Getting out of town. I'm I'm a beach person in the winter. So you might ask how I manage that, but that that's that, you know, I do manage it. <laughs> that's good. I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, especially with all those uh, heating challenges, you gotta gotta right, take the stress right. you off. Gotta time it right, Claire. You gotta time it right. <laughs> okay, next one. Uh, favorite smell and least favorite smell on the farm. Stock. Um, when I p- put the key in the door and open up the door when the stock is in bloom is in bloom in the greenhouse, that scent just hits me at the front door. The the least favorite smell is stock bucket that smells like bad broccoli. That's a good one, Nima. Uh, I'd say uh, lilac. And then um, probably when the greenhouse has just had fish emulsion. <laughs> don't, don't bring your wedding clients into there. <laughs> right, after you've right, done that, right. Right. <laughs> right. No, yeah, we don't. Yeah, no. Um, okay, next one. Hardest part of farming. Hardest part of farming is employees. Oh, yeah. You know, we have a great crew, don't get me wrong, but finding qualified help, that it's really hard. It's really, really hard, you know. Um, managing people, that that's more like it, managing people. Yeah, employees are hard. And then, like, on my back end, like, the taxes, the unemployed, we... We offer unemployment benefits, or at least did last year, you know, all that, just like the bookkeeping. I'd say you read Wendell, or at least for me, I read Wendell Berry and, you know, Alice Walker and things like that. And that's sure not about spreadsheets, okay? But that's what that's what keeps it going. And just like how much of my time now is is spent on that. But then also the reality that like, the owner, you know, it's really hard to farm that out, you know? Yeah. Uh, okay. Next. What do you love besides farming? Travel. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, August, 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 August for sure. <laughs> and travel. You can do both. <laughs> and travel. But yeah. Well, yeah I mean, travel travel with cool. August. August, you want to say hi? Hi. Hi. Hi, August. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> he, he's been very good during this. Okay, stuff. good. Does he have anything to add or say? Do you have anything to say about farming? Mm, no. Do you like it? Mm, yeah. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. An inspiring farmer or land steward you'd want to have as a dinner de- guest, either living or deceased? Wendell Berry. And why? Oh, and why? Just You know, his humor is is, is way of thinking uh, about putting it all together, nature and the whole systems of farming. I just really like the way he thinks. I want to hear more. What about you, Miranda? Uh, Elliot Coleman. I don't know if you've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> I could certainly pick his brain. <laughs> Well, we we I'm maybe we could arrange that at some point. <laughs> okay, um one piece of advice you wish you had starting out or something you wish you had done differently. The layout of the farm. Like I think we rushed it. How we just like came in and put up tunnels. I wish we had slowed that roll down some. I wish I had done more gutter, knew more information about gutter connect tunnels. I think we were really anxious to get in here and get tunnels. Yeah. Well, it makes sense because that means, you know, revenue and income and, (laughs) right? (laughs) It's hard. Right. But if I had, you know, had more information, if I had information that I have now, I would have done it differently. And we're fine with what we got now, of course, but, you know. Yeah, for me, it would be um, pay myself. The moment Nima got a paycheck, I I should have been getting a paycheck too. Yeah. Uh, Okay, next. How do you relate to that which is out of your control? Not very well. (laughs) 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 But, but, 
um, how do you relate to it? You know, mm -hmm. you you have to understand that this is farming. And, you know, before last year, I, the weather, you know, everything's going to come at you. And you have to expect that. Now, I didn't see a pandemic in that list. <laughs> but now we've added the pandemic to the list. So, okay, okay. You just have to, you know, for me, I just have to ride the wave. You know, you have to, like, know that this is a business. This is farming. And no one is going to care for it like you will. This is your baby. You just got to understand that it's all part of it. It's it's just all part of it. And, you know, you have a good cry. You have a few, few drinks. And then you get up the next day and you go, okay, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. Good advice. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it's like, you know, when we started this project, it was, you know, there's a reason there's like 2 million farmers left in the country. And there's, a, I mean, capitalism does is not kind to the small scale, sustainable slash organic farmer. So, you know, going into it, I think both Mima and I kind of had the orientation just generally with life. Like for me, you know, this is my one shot of being Miranda Susan Dushak, and I'm going to try to live the way I think is right the most of the time. And we knew it was stacked against us as women. Uh, Meme, of course, is African-American Black. I'm, I'm a white woman. We're in this partnership. So it's just sort of like, well, we're going to do the best we can and, and see how we can handle it. And now further down the line, nine years into it with employees and more structures and income I'd say just just continually that that orientation, both me and I, Mima and I have sacrificed a lot to this farm and have lived uh, very humbly to be able to have some reserves if there's crop failures or things like that. So um, I, I kind of wish I was more of a praying person, but that kind of not so much, but it's just all part of it. When you sign up for it, you're not in control in this type of business. That's just the way it is. Ride the wave, baby. Ride it. <laughs> Get one time around. Only one time around. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> okay, next. Where and how does wildness enter or influence your farming practice? Well, that was the same question as the last one. <laughs> Look, wildness is, is that you have to be totally pliable. You have to be so, like, ready to take whatever's going to come along the wildness is that you can like see a pandemic come in and go, okay, this is how we're going to ride this wave. The, the wildness is that you have to like be able to pivot on a dime and not be stuck. You know? I mean, when I think about wild, I think about movement and airiness, but also grounded, you know, but, but being wild in that just not being stuck on any one thing or any one process and know that it's all flexible. Uh, just like accept that there will be bindweed. You know? <laughs> 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 it's like, you know, sometimes, yeah, you just got to focus on that harvestable yeah. crop and realize like in annual like yeah. production, is not a supernatural system. You know what I mean? You, with all the soil disruption and weed germination, all that kind of stuff. So we're fighting that and just kind of accept that it's going to not always look so pretty, but the flowers are in the end. Yeah. Okay. Last question. How will you grow old farming? You know, Claire, um, all my friends who I've been doing this with for a long time, this is the year they are retiring. Some have already retired. My friends are either retiring or dead. Okay, my flower farming friends. It's true. So it's, I've had lots of time to think about this because I don't even think like that. I don't even come close to thinking about that, right? I tell people when my time comes, I hope I just fall over in a bed and you all throw some compost and dirt on top of me, add some, add some blood meal so I like decompose faster. <laughs> and, then you, and then you plant some daffodils. Hmm. 
you know, sure, I'm going to slow down. You know, uh, I have employees that are already faster, that way faster than me. But, you know, I don't see myself doing anything different. I mean, what am I going to do? What about you, Miranda? I guess, what, will I be the one covering her, her with, with soil? And, and <laughs> me, that could be me in August. Um, Mima, Mima, Mima's a little over 20 years older than me. So we have, uh, we have a significant age gap. Um, but I, I thought I would come home and be farming full time by 40. And that hasn't, that hasn't proven to be so. So I hope I can enjoy farming before I am too old. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can make it. And then, um, yeah, this is a, this was a long-term plan. So if we can keep the passion alive and keep the soil healthy and the bills paid, I think my dream now is to be able to pass something on to August or at least to have him have an option right when he's older he says to me but you'll run it with me right mommy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i say oh yes honey i'll be right here as long as you need me. so oh well this has been really wonderful and sweet and i've learned so much especially about growing flowers in the winter or something i really did not know much about which is ironic <laughs> <laughs> but always room to learn more. And it's just been delightful to to speak with both of you today. So thank you so much for being here. Hey, Claire, I'm so glad this worked out. I'm so glad Miranda could join us, you know, and, and really, really appreciate you and all the work that you do. Thank you so much for inviting us to be on this podcast today and the opportunity to spread the love. Today's show was produced by me, Clara Coleman, with support from No-Till Growers, Special thank you to Willie Breeding for the theme music. Thank you to the patrons at patreon.com slash no-till growers for helping to make this show possible. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, and, and thank you, August, for your patience. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>